Good evening, welcome. Please take your seats. We're about to get started. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. I am Sebastian Burka, the Director of Corporate Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. On behalf of the Council, thank you all for coming. And I'm delighted to welcome to our platform our speakers for tonight, Professor Wali Adebawi, Ambassador John Campbell, Dr. Funmi Olopade, and Professor Richard Joseph. Uh, to share their views on democracy and insecurity in Africa. Ambassador Campbell's new book, um, Morning in South Africa, is available for a purchase and signature after, after the event in the back from our partners at the bookseller. I'd also like to thank our uh, partners for tonight's program, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Center for Global Health at the University of Chicago, and Northwestern University. Please note that this event is on the record Feel free to use social media. We are live streaming the event as well, but please remember to silence your phones. Thank you. We'll be taking questions uh, during the Q&A portion from the room, but also from, on, uh, from online through our platform. So if you have a, an internet-enabled device, which I'm assuming most of you do, um, the, the link is um, um, posted on the, on the screens over there. Um, it's a CHI dot cnf dot io so you just type that into your browser and you'll be able to ask questions and uh, vote on questions actually for nearly a century the council has provided uh, an independent nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote deeper global understanding and u.s engagement in the world views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council our spring season is in full swing. We have several events coming up just this week, so, and next week. On March 10th, on Friday, we have International Women's Day uh, Global Health Symposium. So that's our annual symposium that we hold around uh, the International Women's Day. Um, on March 13th, we have a, a very interesting discussion on urban waterways in the global city with uh, the uh, Paris mayor, Anne Hidalgo, our own mayor, uh, Ram Emanuel, and Ivo Dalder, the, the president of the Chicago Council. And on March 14th, among other things, we will host David O'Sullivan, the EU ambassador to the United States, um, for an analysis of the current state and future trends in the uh, transatlantic relationship. We have many other programs coming up, so please uh, check our website. And to return to tonight, we look forward to a lively conversation and informative on the challenges and opportunities for democratic governance in Africa. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our uh, speakers. Um, Professor Wali Adenbawi is a professor of African American and African Studies at University of California, Davis. He will assume the position of Rhodes Professor of Race Relations at Oxford University in the summer. Congratulations. He has published extensively on Nigerian politics and is the co-editor of the Africa Journal. Ambassador John Campbell is the Ralph Banchi Senior Fellow for Africa Policy Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He has served in many positions in the U.S. State Department, including as ambassador to Nigeria. He's um, authored several books, and as I mentioned, the most recent one is available <clears throat> after the program. Um, Dr. Funmi Olopade is the Walter Palmer Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine and Human Genetics and Associate Dean for Global Health at the University of Chicago. She also serves as the director of the Center for Global Health at the University of Chicago. She has received uh, numerous awards including a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. And our moderator for tonight is Professor Richard Joseph. He is the John Evans Professor of International History and Politics at Northwestern University and a valued board member of the Chicago Council. So thank you, Professor Joseph. He previously directed the African Governance Program at the Carter Center and coordinated election missions in Zambia, Ghana, and peace initiatives in Liberia, among others. Um, his re research focuses on Africa governance, political economy, and democratization, among others. I will return to moderate the Q&A, but please uh, join me in welcoming our, our speakers for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you all very much uh, for joining us tonight, and thanks to this very uh, distinguished panel um, that we have here. Um, this event, it's a Chicago Council event, but it's also one of a number of events that we're having at Northwestern and also at the University of Chicago over these days. Um, as you're all aware, the 
tremendous progress that has been made um, in democratization in Africa as in other places. But also we've had uh, persistent and even deepening insecurities. Now, um, I'm very conscious of that this particular topic on Africa, democracy, and insecurity, um, it could very well be America, democracy, and insecurity. But anyway, um, we'll probably get to that at some point um, in the evening. Um, what we've agreed to do is um, there are some questions that I've shared with the members of the panel. Um, I will ask them to um, respond, calling on a different person um, to lead off. And when we finish with the three questions, um, we're going to talk a little bit among ourselves, any of the points that come up, and then we're going to open it up, um, and we hope to have substantive time uh, for the question and answer. Okay, um, the first question, and I'll call on uh, Ambassador Campbell to lead off in the response. Is democracy progressing or retreating in Africa or neither? And could you cite um, a few um, examples? Depends on the country. Uh, there are more than 40 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in South Africa, for example, democratic institutions are strong and are getting stronger. There is a lively opposition. And the ruling party, the African National Congress, in recent local elections, lost control of the cities of Pretoria, Johannesburg, and Port Elizabeth. What is particularly interesting about those elections is that the African National Congress fully accepted the results. There were no court cases related to it. And instead of trying to deny what happened, has gone about now trying to reorder itself uh, so that it can win voters back. South Africa, I would argue, is an altogether functioning democracy. And as I say, the institutions are getting stronger. South Africa, Botswana is similar, Namibia, similar, Senegal, another, another example. Then there are the fragile democracies. Nigeria, for example, where in the most recent presidential election for the very first time, the opposition came to power through credible elections. If this continues, if democracy consolidates there, we're talking about by far the largest African country, uh, which includes one out of every four or one out of uh, every five sub-Saharan Africans. Um, I would put Ghana in much the same category, a democracy, albeit fragile. Then there are those where in democratic institutions remain very weak or non-existent. Zimbabwe, um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, it's difficult in those two particular cases to see how a, a, a movement in a democratic trajectory uh, can be achieved without some sort of major upheaval. So is sub-Saharan Africa on a democratic trend, uh, uh, trajectory? Um, some parts of it are. Some parts of it are making progress. And in some parts, there has been very little progress. Thank you, John. Professor Debanwi, would you come in? Yes, I, I agree with that, that you know, um, it's a mixed grill. You know, uh, all over the continent, you have, as Ambassador um, mentioned, uh, countries that are actually largely yeah. deeply democratic, like um, um, Mauritius, uh, Botswana, to some extent in South Africa. And then we, you have the mid-range <laughs> democratic uh, states uh, like Nigeria, as you mentioned, Ghana, and then you have uh, countries that are really democratic states, but they are really not democratic uh, countries, and they are largely in turmoil. Countries like DRC, um, 
to some extent, you know, uh, Chad, the rest of them. Then, so you have that, you know, whole gamut uh, going on in Africa. But we must uh, acknowledge that since the 1980s, there has been a lot of progress. At least democratic rule is now commonplace, uh, whether fully democratic or not. Uh, so we have that trend. And then there has been a lot of improvement in civil liberties you know, over the last uh, three decades. Uh, Freedom House estimates that about 61% of African countries are now free or partly free. Although in the last five or six years, uh, there has been some reverses because uh, about six years ago, the percentage was 71%, but it's now 61%. So that also shows that you know, uh, the point that the ambassador mentioned about fragile democracy, that it's possible to also have reverses of some of these gains. Uh, but beyond that, you have also those democracies that are, has all, 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 uh, that are democracies only in name. Uh, you've had, you know, cases, uh, about three or four cases where you have leaders who have been in power for more than two decades, in some three cases, more than three decades, uh, in Uganda, uh, in uh, Equatoria, Guinea. Uh, so these are uh, also, they actually been mutating more or less, changing with the times. Why not changing? Uh, so we have also those cases, and in virtually all those states where, including Zimbabwe, where the leaders have been in power for so long, you also have a lot of challenges in terms of the transparency of elections, accountability, and also respect for human rights. So it's a mystery, but. Uh, the challenge is to consolidate on the gains of the last uh, three decades and ensure that continue to expand the space for democratic rule in Africa. Okay, so um, Professor Lopade, you want to join these political experts with how you see things <laughs> well, from you your know, perspective? I, yeah, I see things from human development, right? And, uh, and so if you look across uh, African countries, you know, we can only measure uh, democratic rule by whether the country is actually uh, becoming wealthier and healthier. And uh, so we had this idea that we will have great economic development and, um, uh, and a lot of countries will be able to get their uh, people from poverty into the uh, middle class. And I think with the economic crisis, uh, we were very optimistic, but things are not so... Uh, good for some countries. And so I always like to think about democracy in terms of, are you talking about rich democracies or are you talking about poor countries that are actually trying to participate in the, uh, you know, the global economy? So from the, um, you know, human development index, I, I you know, I, you know, traveling through many countries, uh, I think the people are actually trying to uh, live in a free society. Um, I see, you know, movements across West Africa, East Africa, uh, and, you know, I was just in South Africa. And what was actually quite interesting is when I got to Johannesburg, I saw the difference in the fact that ANC was no longer ruling in, in Johannesburg. People were now able to express what they feel about their government. The students were actually demonstrating because they wanted better education, but the government doesn't have the resources to actually fund the education. So a lot of the instability and what you say about the insecurity is that yes, all these countries want to participate in democratic um, reforms, but then they cannot uh, fulfill the aspirations of their people, right? So they've gone to the uh, ballot, they have voted for you, but they still have no water, no uh, health uh, uh, systems that are working for them. And that really causes uh, a lot of instability. So I think that when we're thinking about what's happening in, uh, among African countries, yes, I agree fully that they, even in South Africa that we think has the you know, democratic uh, um, uh, established, uh, well-established I'm worried about South Africa because the apartheid system uh, has not solved the problem of the masses and the poor people in that country. And ANC managed to continue to, to rule them, and now they're beginning to wake up and to say, this cannot happen in our own country. So even South Africa is not as stable as I would have liked it to be. And it's because the rich 
cannot hide themselves in their uh, uh, quarters without really thinking about the masses that are restless now. All right, thank you. I can see I really have some professionals here. Their <laughs> time management is extraordinary. <laughs> All right, we're gonna, um, there's some issues that came up we're going to come back to, but let me go on to the second question. And this is, um, there are several forms of insecurity, and you all have already mentioned some of them here. Um, which concern you most? And also, what more can be done to reduce the challenges? And I'm going to start off with you this time, Professor Lopadi. Yeah, well, so all sorts of insecurity, but food insecurity is the one that I, you know, is sort of right in front of us, right? Um, lots of people are displaced in northern Nigeria because of climate change and the fact that they have a famine there. And that causes uh, instability and the political, the food insecurity in the north is affecting uh, uh, migrant, uh, you know, cattle rearers who are coming south and that's causing a conflict because there's just not enough food for uh, everyone. So I think that, uh, uh, and the fact that when you have conflicts, when you don't have uh, good governance and people can, are hungry and people can't um, feed their family and they have no jobs, I think that really causes a significant concern across uh, the Sahel in, in West Africa, across mm -hmm. the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think until we address that food insecurity, um, which affects, you know, ability of children to survive uh, and, to, you know, the, uh, to grow up to be healthy adults. Um, that's what I'm most concerned about. Okay, very good. John, could you come in here now? Yes, I guess, I guess the most obvious sign of insecurity are insurrections. And if you look at Nigeria, there are two. There's one in the far northeast associated with Boko Haram and the other in the Niger Delta. Both of them seem to me to be driven by poor governance and by a profound sense of isolation of the general population from their governments. And it is the divorce or the isolation of too many Africans from their governments that worries me the most. To that, I would add black swans. In other words, things that are out there that we don't focus on much but can suddenly sail in front of us, causing all kinds of havoc. The two that I have in mind are climate change, where in Nigeria, in the north, there's desertification, pushing traditional herdsmen south, where they collide with peasant farmers. But also in the south, where the melting of the Arctic and the Antarctic is causing sea levels in the Gulf of Guinea to rise faster than almost anywhere else in the world. The city of Lagos, which has a population of perhaps 22 million, much of it is below sea level. And there have already been disastrous floods two years ago in the Niger Delta. So I worry about climate change. I also worry, doctor, about an area that's your area of expertise, which is disease. Uh, HIV AIDS, uh, Ebola, um, Zika is not of an African origin, but it has a potential for devastating uh, the continent and other diseases which we may as yet have not identified. All right, Wally, um, come in. Yes, um, as has been identified, I think uh, environmental security is the most uh, challenging uh, thing that African countries face. Uh, and I think all the issues that have been raised are connected to the environment. Um, a few examples have already been provided. If you look at the drought in Southern Africa recently, mm -hmm. put about that about 20 million people were their life livelihood were, was under threat in, with the drought, and you know uh, the climate change, of course, the way it has affected uh, many parts of the continent. But the challenge here is that African countries are yet to act, African leaders rather are yet to identify the environment as a major threat 
to human and natural, national security. And so even, there had been, even though there had been some initiatives, uh, especially in the Sahel region, about 11 countries that covered the Sahel region to do something about this, uh, an initiative to plant trees, a massive tree planting initiative, but none of the governments have actually responded to this. And so you have, uh, in the last 100 years, the Sahara has expanded by 250 kilometers. Now the estimate is between one to three kilometer per year. What that means, of course, as the ambassador mentioned, is that more and more people are going south, especially you know, the pastoral communities. And this is causing all sorts of crises, clashes, violent crashes, consuming human lives in many parts of um, the continent. And it also has implications for diff other areas of uh, national life, from the social to the economic to the political. So I think this is the crisis of our time, and it's important that African leaders pay attention to do it and begin to actually take measures to reverse the, the trend. Yeah, and before we go on to the, the third question that we had identified, um, what I'm hearing from your responses is that these issues are obviously connected in terms of environment, in terms of climate change, in terms of food, all right, in terms of water. Um, you know, some of the members of the audience here, and I know some of the panel here, um, would have seen this remarkable um, video, Nowhere to Run, um, that the council, together with MacArthur Foundation, showed um, that was made by the Shihu Yarajua Center having to do with Nigeria. So what I'm thinking of, obviously this, this issue about environment and food insecurity, um, many people were aware of the, the forced migration of people because their areas cannot survive their livelihoods and so on. It sounds like this might be one area in which um, you know, Americans, the global community, can focus on with regard to Africa because there don't seem to be any kind of ideological or political you know, divisions concerning it. A any responses? Is that something that could be taken up with regard to Africa in some kind of a collective, collaborative way? Is it in, Whoever wants in the to West? Yeah, speaking about Western, you know, these countries, every, all the countries are so divided nowadays, but is that something around which we can have a, a sort of global attention given the significance? Just I think there's some debate. I mean, some people still don't accept that climate change is real, so, <laughs> I, 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 so to even get people to accept the reality of that science is, is a problem now in, in the United States of all places. So um, I don't think there is you know, the opportunity for the kind of global consensus that you, you, you describe. Um, but of course, I mean, a, there is a, a remarkable, I mean, there is a substantial part of the, the establishment, if you want to call it that, that actually believes in this science that can help to do something about it. But I think in this period, maybe in the next four years and maybe eight years, this initiative would have to be outside of you know, the governmental process in the US if you yeah, want but, to well, pay attention right, to yeah. it. Before we, before we go there, I yeah. want to deal with the situation on the ground yeah. rather so, than... Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of really uh, wonderful people who are thinking about the problem of Boko Haram in Nigeria, right? And most people, including scholars that I have spoken to in Nigeria, believe that the problem is related to climate change, the fact that you have the desert moving south, and the herdsmen can't graze their land, and it's causing a lot of political unrest in Nigeria. And when you talk to different people, they might think it's related to religion because it's predominantly Muslim North. And then in the South, you have Christian and then you have the clash. So if you want to use that to your political advantage, you can. And that's why the democracy in Nigeria is fragile because we have the religious division. However, if we can get everyone to agree that it's not about religion, it's about people starving and looking for food. It's about this herdsmen bringing food in. In fact, I once heard that if southerners in Nigeria stop eating 
meat, maybe we will have less trouble, right? But most of the meat is consumed by people in the South, and yet, you know, there's the, 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 the um, uh, deforestation. So I think we, this is actually the time that we should do something about it. I don't think we can accept that the political will is not there on the part of the United States. I think there are enough people who b do believe that we have to come together as a global community to fight against uh, uh, environmental degradation. I think that movie, that, that documentary on No Place to Run, I wish we could continue to show it to people in Nigeria and people across uh, 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 West Africa because really we have to do something about it. And I think food insecurity is something that everyone can get themselves around, right? We don't have to call it climate change. We can just say, feed the starving children, and then maybe everybody will, <laughs> will gather around it. But that's really where it all, I, I think we can you know, gather some momentum. Richard, your question was specifically about food security. And presumably informing it is the fact that there are at least two million internally displaced persons in northeastern Nigeria where there is a significant amount of famine. Okay, the United States certainly has the ability to deliver tons of food to northeastern Nigeria. There is no objective reason why people are starving to death in northeastern Nigeria. Those issues can all be addressed. But there has to be an awareness of what is going on and the political will to address it. I would remind you that during the recent presidential campaign, and the seemingly unending series of debates, Africa was not mentioned once. Mm -hmm. President Trump, then Mr. Trump, altogether has issued some 30,000 tweets. Those tweets are searchable. I had my research associate search them. Out of the 30,000, he found four, or maybe five. One was about how glorious Nelson Mandela was, and the other three were about how Africa is a sinkhole of corruption. So I would suggest that while Africa has a major problem with famine, we here in the United States also have a major problem with respect to inattention. All right, you all are <clears throat> pulling me to that other topic, so I'll go to it. <laughs> um, and the question is, um, Brexit, the election of Donald Trump, and the global rise of populism and authoritarianism have enhanced anxiety and uncertainty. And in fact, it seems to be happening daily. What can be done in Africa to advance political and socioeconomic inclusion in an era of divisiveness and nationalism? And uh, Wally, I'll call on you to go first. OK. Um, as uh, we discussed uh, earlier today, uh, one central thing that needs to be done is the rethinking and the reconstitution of most of the African states. Uh, in virtually every African state, you have groups, you know, either religious, ethnic, or different groups, struggling either to get out of those states, to reconstitute them, or to redraw the borders. I'm not advocating for redrawing borders, or, or I mean, redrawing the borders, but there needs to be a process by which these African states, each of the African states, uh, of most of the African states that face this challenge uh, are able to find uh, processes of reconstitution such that, and this will include one, decentralization. I think that's a major thing, devolution of power, and which will help substantially in solving most of the critical problems that these countries, the political problems that they face. Another critical thing that I think is important is the strengthening of uh, institutions, 
uh, civil society, you know, free press, and other democratic institutions that help to sustain uh, and, and uh, promote uh, democracy. Um, I think one other thing that uh, needs to be done, I don't know how this will be done in different cases, there has to be term limit. Many of these leaders in Africa have found ways of changing constitutions to extend their terms. If, and in virtually every case, uh, this has led to crisis, uh, sometimes you know, a violent crisis. So you need to have a situation in which the world, uh, the, the, the West, uh, helps to support processes by which constitutions would not be changed to extend, extend the term of those who are in power. Um, at most, five-year, two-term limit for most of these countries. And I think this is one way to stop you know, uh, the new phenomenon in which you know, old dictators are mutating into Democrats who are still you know, take, staying in power forever. So I think this is, uh, uh, the, the last thing that I will mention is how to help to strengthen the middle class. Uh, African democracies would largely survive uh, with the expansion of the middle class. The, the, the level of poverty that exists uh, in many of these countries almost uh, make it impossible to be able to sustain democracy in the long term. So it's important to help you know, to processes that would you know, lead to the expansion of the middle class, which will be very critical to sustaining a democratic rule. Okay, um, yes, let me ask you, um, Professor Lupadi, to, to come in here, and again, getting back to the essence of this question, that we have these global trends leading towards you know, division, um, nationalism, authoritarianism. Um, in Africa, um, we've worked very hard <laughs> to advance um, along those axes. So, you know, how do you see the situation from your perspective? Yeah, I've actually been thinking a lot about sort of, you know, how do you govern in the cultural context, right? The devolution that you're talking about. You know, that's where the, the kings and obers and the way Africans organized themselves previously before we have colonial drawing of maps, right? So the question is, do we let the colonial drawings stay the way they are, or do we go back to our tribes and chiefs and have that governance be the uh, seat of governance? So the, the um, governor in Ekiti State, uh, who is one of your former students, really wanted to make sure that the devolution occurred and you could give power to the local uh, governments where people can actually begin to see that the government is working for them. And, and I think if we actually did that and forget about the federal government, uh, people might be able to sort of govern themselves. But the problem is that if there's nothing being created in your local government, to create wealth for that population, and you don't have a federal government that is giving you money to run your local government, then you have nothing. So I would think that you know, in the instance where um, you have you know authoritarian uh, government, uh, because everybody depends on the federal government, then of course they can consolidate power and they can you know, uh, you know retain power by you know patronage. Right. However, I think that, as you said, if there's no middle class, if there's no economic development, if people are poor where they live, then there's no one who can govern them because they're hungry and they'll rise up. And that's where we missed Brexit. That's where we missed what was going on in some of these uh, places, the rural communities in this country. So how do we get rural development and get people to feel that the government is working for them because they don't see the government working for them because there's nothing happening in their local government. So I don't know the solution, but I certainly think that if we can figure out a way to get you know, the cultural context, to get the, the way Africans have governed themselves for, ye for generations before we have these maps, maybe we can figure out a way to get devolution uh, at the community level. Very good. And let me call you in on this, John. You want to? Uh, political and social inclusion. Mm. Uh, this, I think, is primarily an African responsibility. And it's going to vary tremendously 
from one place to another. What about we outsiders who are essentially marginal to this process? It seems to me that there are two rules of thumb. The first is, first, do no harm. And that means considering what the consequences might be of US arms sales to African governments, or the provision of military training to African armies, which may be well used against their own citizens. The second point is that I think we outsiders can support and encourage African civil society, African civil organizations that are pushing for democracy and good government. Here, American NGOs have, I think, an increasingly important role. That's because there is a massive recessional underway in Washington. The State Department and USAID's budget is to be cut somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. That means, in effect, foreign assistance, as we have thought about it in the past, will very largely disappear. It also means that the historic coordinating efforts by the federal government of assistance efforts and a variety of different levels comes to an end. That means private American NGOs are going to have much greater responsibilities in the future than they've had in the past. All right, let me, um, and this is going to be the last uh, set of comments for me and your responses before we, we go to the audience. Um, you know, I'm hearing a, a few things uh, from the discussions we have. In fact, I attended a conference a year ago, the Abaddon School of Government and Public Policy had its inaugural meeting. And the central question has come up here again, and that is making government work. Um, and then the second one, um, and Professor Lopade, when you talk about um, you know, making people wealthier, healthier, and more secure. And so it's making government work, but making government work for us. Mm -hmm. And the third one, it gets a little more abstract, but you all have been talking about it. In fact, uh, Roger Meyerson here started the conversation before we even began the event by mentioning to me his interest in, uh, in state building and one of his, um, the ideas he keeps raising every time we meet um, is the idea, and it sounds very logical, that if you could get government closer to the people, maybe there's a better chance that they would look after their interests. I mean, it just sounds pretty logical. But we do have the experience of Nigeria, which has had a federal system and state governments and local governments. Mm -hmm. Kenya has gone through a, a devolution program, and of course, South Africa has got its provincial government. But at least there is this sense, right, yeah. that if that entity called the state is not working for us, then maybe some entity closer to us. Of yeah. course, but then the question comes up, then what becomes of the state? But uh, we, we might not go there now. But I'd like to just you know, conclude uh, this conversation with making government work, making government work for us, and the, the structure that would help to accomplish that. Any one of you could take the lead. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, Ghana has uh, changed its uh, precedent mm -hmm. in a democratically elected um, right. uh, 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 government. And one of the things that has been surprising for anyone watching Ghana is that the government is now closer to the people. Right, the health systems, there is a Ghana health system that actually works from the community level to all the way to the tertiary level. And every time you ask people why the government isn't working for them, it's about resources, right? And so unless you have productivity, 
uh, from these countries that would allow those, gov those uh, local governments to be able to work and to service people, then they still wouldn't feel it, right? So the things that people are worried about, you know, education for their children, uh, to make sure that you, you, the children survive them mm -hmm. and that the children go to school and get jobs and that those jobs are there in the community. And what's really unfortunate is that so many young people have education uh, mm -hmm. through the public uh, uh, school system and then there are no jobs. And they all move to the big cities and there are no jobs. And that really causes urban problems and challenges. So I think as much as we want to push the government closer to the people, we also have to push jobs closer to the people. And I don't think governments can create jobs. So unless you have private enterprises in those communities, then we still have the problem of people leaving the rural communities to come to big cities. And then, of course, big cities are really a, a, a challenge both here in, in a big city like Chicago and every big city that's sort of, you know, uh, sprawling in, in, in Africa. I don't know what you see. Um, with respect to the relationship between the government and the people it governs, I think that question is closely tied to a sense of national identity. A sense of national identity in Ghana is quite strong. Very strong. It's quite strong. And that accounts in part, I think, uh, for some of the successes in Ghanaian government uh, over the past decade. It's also extremely strong in South Africa, straight across the racial rainbow. South Africans all know they're South Africans. Thank you very much. That is a primary uh, source of identity. In countries where a sense of national identity is much weaker or even declining, very often governments are seen as something that essentially are exploitive, something you want to have as little to do with as you possibly can, something that you want to retreat from. So that those countries with a strong sense of national identity have a, uh, a step up I think, in addressing the questions of the relationship between those who govern and those who are governed. Yes, Wally? Yeah, I think the problem with devolution of power and decentralization is that it's often top down. There are people at the national level who design the processes for decentralization and devolution of power. So in the end, the government that you want to bring nearer to the people would not be nearer to the people because this was designed from the top. So this you know, uh, relates to the question of the reconstitution and the rethinking of the African state. It's important that people are actually involved in the design of the structure so that the processes of devolution of power and the decentralization involve the people so they can design the best ways in which government at the local level can actually serve their interests. As we've seen in a few of the federations in Africa, uh, the Nigerian example is very clear. Local governments are not instruments of good governance. That's right. They are instruments of the distribution of the largesse from the center. So you've seen, I've actually been personally involved with going to visit friends who are running local governments. There are many places they meet when their location comes from the federal government and they disappear at the end of the week after sharing it until the next month. So this is not local government. This is just an instrument by which the country is divided. So we need a, a system of devolution and decentralization of power that actually involves the people so that they can take control of the government that is nearest and closest to them. Okay. And just one uh, sort of historical point I want to make, since you mentioned about Ghana, that under the military government led by Jerry Rawlings, um, they created this, this system of district, um, you know, local um, government councils, um, and then they entrenched it in the constitution. Uh, so that, you know, the subsequent um, civilian governments would have to now implement that system that was essentially created um, during that era. Okay, um, we're going to open it up to you all. Um, and so, um, oh, sorry, you. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Wait for the microphone. My colleagues are in the audience. And please make sure it's a, it's a question and not a comment. Um, <laughs> right there, Louise. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Louise Iverson with the Chicago Council's Global Food and Agriculture Program. So first, thank you for the rich discussion on global food security. Uh, my question is about youth populations in Africa. Uh, so many countries have uh, such large proportions that are youth, and these uh, numbers are only projected to grow in the next few decades. What, what does this mean? Is this an opportunity for democracy and security, or is it a challenge, or, or both? Thank you. You want to take a few and then come back? We can, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, there was yeah. another hand up here. Oh, yes, please. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Has there been um, any um, awareness of the use of local transportation bicycles around Africa, which I know has happened over the last 10 years and had an impact on the ground? in terms of increasing the, the um, economy and access to school and health care. Is that being factored into some of what the government is trying to do? I know there is, there was a huge, there's been a huge initiative since uh, 2006, and uh, there have been many, many bicycles that have, uh, research projects have shown in, in Zambia and Kenya and Uganda and otherwise have made a big difference in terms of the economics getting much better. And I know the initiative started as a charity, but the governments are now doing things. And I'm wondering if you all are aware of that and if that's a plan, because that seems like getting the community to be uh, facilitating the improvement in their economy and education. So I was just wondering about that. Thank you very much um, for your very insightful comments. I'm wondering if you could speak to the role of religious leaders in particular, given the transition to multipartyism, as you've discussed, um, multipartyism both in terms of a competitive authoritarian types of regimes and vibrant and flourishing democracies. Given the variation in regime type, how do you see religious leaders playing a role in partisan politics, addressing public service provision, um, and being a kind of broker between their populations and the governments in varied contexts from South Africa to Nigeria and beyond? Thank you. Anyone okay. who wants to? <laughs> Which Pick one should we start? <laughs> you, you're okay. the professor of politics. <laughs> Yes, I think the question about youth is, is a very, um, very important question. Uh, in most of our, the African countries now, you have almost more than 50% of the population that would be categorized as youth, although, although as you know, I mean, what constitutes youth in every country is different. Uh, there seems to be a pattern in Africa because of the process of social maturation and the challenges of the environment means that people are still youth, sometimes when they're in their late 30s and early 40s. But, um, you, uh, in many of these countries, the latest statistics, I think, uh, those who are under 12 are almost about a third of the population, and youth in general, more than half of the population. So that's a huge problem, where you have ordinarily huge potential, it ought to be, but you, the youth bulge has been described as a problem, in fact, a potential crisis in Africa because of the lack of, I mean, the absence of opportunities, uh, educational, you know, opportunities, social infrastructure, and all of those challenges. So it's important that those fundamental crises that some of which we have mentioned here, they need to be resolved quickly. Otherwise, you know, as the population continues to grow the way it's been growing in the last uh, two decades, uh, youth in Africa will constitute more of a problem than an asset. And that's, you know, really tragic because in every society, youth ought to constitute an asset rather than a problem because if it, the opportunities continue to constrict, you know, uh, it cannot, uh, the youth will certainly constitute a crisis. Um, in terms of the, the question about uh, local bicycles, um, I don't know if I understand it very well. Uh, does this also relate to motorcycles or just strictly bicycles? No, there's been uh, almost 50,000. Ma'am, please wait for the microphone because we're live streaming, so. Sorry. <coughs> Thank there you. There have been um, uh, almost 50,000 bicycles distributed and research has followed 
their impact on the economy, access to health care, treatment for HIV AIDS, as well as uh, education attendance. Okay. And so I'm aware of that program. I went to Zambia and um, witnessed some of that. And I'm aware of the research. And I wondered, because you're talking about ground up versus top down, um, whether that's factoring in, because it's having such a substantial impact on so many positive things, economy and so forth. People are, are um, using those transportation modes to improve their functioning. And um, so I was wondering if people knew about it. I hadn't heard. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think maybe I can uh, jump in here. I think the issue of um, NGOs really, um, and that all includes, you know, uh, religious organizations that are really trying to help in Africa. They, I mean, they are contributing in, in, not, in significant ways to improving the lives of uh, poor people. But I think the big issue is sustainability and infrastructure that actually will support all those donated bicycles. So in communities where there are no roads, in fact, when the roads are filled with potholes, what we have as a major health crisis in most African countries is actually trauma and road traffic accidents. All these bicyclists are just killed on the roads, right? Because they're trying to get from one place to the other. Or in big cities where people are trying to cross because they don't have crossing uh, 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 stations. So I think, you know, it's, uh, to me, I think infrastructure and using uh, uh, sort of the, the uh, religious leaders and, and uh, 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 organizations can actually mobilize in a way to provide the necessary infrastructure. And I don't think we're going to solve the problems of the youth and also the problem of the population until we actually develop solid infrastructure to support the people where they live. And that's why good governance is needed, right? So that the countries can build the roads so that the bicycles and the cars and all those things can happen. And until we do that, it's just patchwork. I know of one program uh, in Kaduna whereby policing is done on bicycles. Bicycles are manufactured in Kaduna and they cost only about $20. And in a densely populated urban area, which is what Kaduna is, there clearly is a role, and that small program has clearly been successful. It was started as a local initiative. The use of training police to patrol on bicycles that was the result of a little tiny USAID program in which the instructors were retired policemen from the District of Columbia. So you're talking about a very small kind of, of program, but it has clearly worked there. Urban, and I think your point about rural areas is terribly important, and I would not want to ride a bicycle in downtown Lagos. Um, <laughs> if I could comment just a bit on the youth bulge, Again, I think it's very important to distinguish one country from another. In South Africa, the population is increasing by less than 1% a year. In other words, the population is growing more slowly than the economy is, which over time is a, is a good thing. On the other hand, in parts of northern Nigeria, women are still bearing somewhere between six and seven children. Though in the southern part of Nigeria, the numbers of children that women bear approaches that of, of Europe and the United States. So there's, there's a huge variation in terms of, uh, uh, of population. And then there's still the question about religion. Yes. Um, uh, my view is that the religious leaders uh, played a very, very critical role in the era of democratization in Africa from the late 80s until the early 1990s. But uh, at least according to the kind of literature that I'm exposed to, uh, the, role has, the role of religious leaders has, uh, has really not been uh, very positive uh, after the democratization, the period of democratization. 
Uh, in fact, the, in many places, and uh, as was mentioned earlier, it's important to also understand that there are variations across uh, the continent. But let's focus uh, now on Pentecostal Christianity, which is the fastest growing in uh, the Christian faith in Africa. It has aligned itself more with state power in, in the last decade and a half, uh, even though it was part of that process of democratization earlier. But more important, I mean, it was the Protestant Christianity and Catholic Christianity that was, you know, that were in, in the forefront of that struggle in the era of democratization. But since then, uh, Protestant Christianity is now really in many places. There will be a few exceptions ac across the continent aligned with state power. And it has also become an instrument of massive enrichment. So I, in fact, in, in the cases that I'm very familiar with in Western Africa and Southern Africa, I think the role of Pentecostal Christianity has been somewhat negative in relation to the democratic, you know, uh, to expansion of democratic space. Uh, and one other major problem, which I think we should pay attention to, and I think we flagged this in uh, our discussion earlier in the morning, is the way in which uh, Pentecostal Christianity, particularly, has helped uh, to consolidate an attitude towards the deficiencies of the state, in which people now take troubles that ought to be solved by, by the, the state. state to God. Um, <laughs> yes. I remember discussing with a friend of mine who is a member of the Redeemed Faith. Redeemed Christian Church is perhaps the largest Pentecostal congregation in the continent. And it's transnational. It's almost everywhere in the world now. And I was asking him, they have this retreat at the end of the month where millions of people gather. The roads are terrible. And this is multi-billion dollar you know, religious organization. And I say, if we had a good government in Nigeria, do you think you have as, so, as many people who gather every weekend to pray? Um, I'm serious about this. When I go to revivals in Nigeria, you know, as a social scientist, and I've been a journalist half my life, so this never leaves you. When they ask us to all pray, you know, this old prayer in which everybody is praying, sometimes I try to listen to what people are praying about. And sometimes I catch some of these small things. Some people do pray about fear to be able to take boss back home. And I will almost like, you know, I will solve that problem. Can you let God listen to a greater problem that you know, <laughs> some people are here? So, much of the crisis that people take to the church in Africa, the reasons why we set up the state. So if we have efficient states, it will change the character of you know, Pentecostal Christianity. And I think in a way, these Pentecostal leaders would want situations to continue like this so that they can have greater, you know, but that's, that's, my, uh, that's where I stand. In South Africa, uh, religious leaders were at the forefront of the anti-apartheid movement. But it's interesting. It tended to be the mainstream Christian churches, um, the Anglicans, Presbyterians, Roman Catholics. It was not the Pentecostal churches. The Pentecostal churches withdrew from the anti-apartheid struggle, the Zion Christian Church being the largest denomination in South Africa. It had nothing to do with politics at all. But the interesting thing there is once non-racial political life revived, People like Archbishop Tutu deliberately withdrew from political life on the basis that it was no longer necessary for them to participate in it. That, in other words, political life should proceed within the structure of, dem of democratic institutions. So again, as is so often the case, enormous variation across the uh, continent. I very much agree with my colleague's characterization of the influence of the Pentecostal churches in West Africa, particularly. Okay, maybe we could Great. There's no. have more time. Uh, third row here, please. <clears throat> the microphone is coming. It's on the other side. Um, yes, I've, I've listened. Oh. It's on. It's on? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I listened to you saying that you, you regard South Africa as a particularly stable country within Africa, and I just wondered if you had an opinion as to uh, President Zuma's latest uh, comment about taking over the farms um, mm -hmm. without compensation. 
sure. and what you think the effect of that would be? Sure. Um, the Zuma government uh, is a corrupt mess. It is in a very difficult position politically, and a part of what it has been doing is resorting to radical rhetoric, uh, such as expropriation without compensation of all white property. The reason why South Africa is so stable is that the democratic institutions and the rule of law and the independent judiciary thwarts the kinds of excesses of the Zuma administration at every single uh, uh, place. Let me give you a specific example. As part of an effort to curry popularity, um, particularly uh, in East Africa, the Zuma government announced that South Africa was going to withdraw from the International Criminal Court. A, a civil organization sued in the South African courts. The South African courts declared that withdrawal was illegal. It was illegal because the Treaty of Rome that established the International Criminal Court is, was incorporated into South African law. So the only way South Africa could withdraw from the International Criminal Court would be if Parliament voted to change the law. And there aren't the votes in Parliament to do it. So what you're talking about are structures and institutions that carry the country over a patch of very bad governance. When I wrote that section of my book, I was really thinking about uh, the last couple of years of the Nixon administration, where American institutions were strong enough to carry us over a patch of very bad governance. Yeah, yeah Sebastian. Uh, be I just want to, before we go back to the audience, um, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, we've had a, you know, series of meetings, and I just want to just say a few words about, you know, two sets of issues that, you know, we have been really, um, you know, debating. Um, and the first one um, is a notion of what we're calling affirming democracy, right? And... Uh, Ambassador Campbell made a very important point at, um, in one of our meetings, saying that um, the, what has happened you know, you know, in the United States and what has happened in Europe is that there were governments that played a very important role in supporting a lot of the activities on the ground. And that because of what is happening in the US and what's happening in Europe, that in fact, that is not going to be there. And therefore, thinking of how you actually now, you know, um, prevent these reversals and also strengthen what's in place. And it's a, an issue that's out there and it's going to be facing us. The second, we didn't really get to, but I will bring forward. And again, is really, again, focusing on the real massive kinds of insecurities that we have in the continent. The boat people are really the result of a lot of insecurities that then end up with people setting sail on these rickety boats. Mm -hmm. We have the problems in Ethiopia right now. What is going on in Ethiopia? We have the Congo and what is going on in the Congo. And then we have Zimbabwe, right? And in all of these cases, we don't have answers to the profound kind of insecurities that the people are feeling given the kind of governments they have. So I just want to, you know, just make sure to, you know, that as we discuss these things, rec to recognize that we've got some real serious questions um, that, you know, that we're going to be trying to address during these meetings and going forward. So Thank you. Well, we actually have a, a question from online, yeah. which relates to what you just said. Uh, so the, the question is, does uh, foreign aid help or harm emerging democracies in Africa? Great question. <laughs> Voted top question. So. Yeah, yeah. You all want to take a crack at that? Of course, John is right. Sure. Your way um, first of all, there isn't very much foreign aid. Um, for example, uh, foreign aid to Nigeria is U.S. foreign aid. First of all, will almost certainly disappear next year with a with a cut in the State Department budget of somewhere between thirty and forty percent. But even under the Obama administration, it was very small and was almost entirely in the area of health, particularly HIV-AIDS, and to a lesser extent, 
tuberculosis. There was a very small program that also supported uh, female literacy campaigns. So there isn't very much. If you're talking about what actually can assist African economic development, look at reducing trade barriers of various sorts. Uh, and the African Growth and Opportunity Act um, was a, a major initiative uh, in that direction. For those countries that qualify for it, it means that their exports to the United States come in essentially duty free. And that generates economic activity in Africa that has a, a very positive uh, uh, consequences. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the idea that uh, you build civil societies, I think we've talked about a lot of problems, but I also see the opportunities uh, uh, that some of the young people have taken to actually be able to participate in exposing ills in their government, right? I mean, social media can be good or bad, but young people are engaged. And I can speak for Nigeria and the fact that everyone is wired to what's coming up in the news. My 97-year-old mother participates in Nigerian government because she listens to the radio and has a commentary on what the government is doing based on what she hears on the mm -hmm. radio, right? So I think that governments are trying to reach the people. And the question is, without aid from the US, will people now take the gains they have made? I mean, a lot of people from West Africa complain, are saying, what's going on in America, right? And they are able to participate in this dialogue. So I think that what we need to do is really to make sure that civil society remains strong. And there's a good group of people who have access to knowledge, who have access to information. Even all these young people that we're talking about, there's no village in Africa where somebody is not wired to their cell phone, mm -hmm. right? And the question is, what kinds of information are we going to be providing for them? How will we make them be accountable to, make their governments be accountable to them? So I actually am much more optimistic uh, that this country, with or without aid, will not disappear. And that what we need to do is to now strengthen some of the gains we have made and double the efforts to, to, to help people who are already on the ground. So I agree with you. We may not have a government that will send foreign aid to Africa. Maybe that's not what they need. But we need private enterprise. We need to get more entrepreneurs developed. And there are incubators all over East Africa, West Africa, where young people are being trained to engage in a global economy. So I hope that helps. Yeah, I have nothing to There was a, one My question answer. in the front row, please. Yeah, I, Here. Wait for the microphone, uh, doctor, please. Raise. Thank you. I was going to raise the um, issue of corruption, uh, which is a major uh, impediment to the economic development of it's most of the African it's countries, not. especially if you look at corruption from the um, uh, corruption of the institutions, the judiciary, the public service uh, system. Um, if you don't have um, a system of actually you know, honoring agreements and things like that. I don't know if there's any chance for some of these uh, uh, democracies to be successful. Do you have any thoughts on how uh, dealing with uh, corruption, especially as it relates to corruption of the basic institutional uh, framework of these countries, uh, how we can get them out to, be, uh, to, to, to enjoy economic development? So we'll take it over to you. I wanted to sharpen Roger Myers from University of Chicago. I wanted to sharpen the, uh, the the question about does foreign aid do harm? I, I, oh, I obviously I was you know I was pleased to hear you talk about decentralization as possibly important for the establishment of, of strong, good democratic government in Africa. Certainly, we in America think that 
the foundations of our, of, of our successful democracy depend not just on voting, but also on a balanced distribution of power between the federal government and, and the state and local governments. Uh, and my question is, so, so of course, one way that, that the best intended foreign assistance can really do harm is if the, the money that's sent in to, do, to help people is all f funneled through the, the ministries of the national government and therefore ends up upsetting the, a, a balance between national authority and, and local authorities and by, by strengthening local authority, by, by strengthening the national authorities. The question is, has foreign assistance from America or other countries uh, helped to promote a balanced distribution of power between local government and national government? And is there, are there ways that foreign assistance whether official or NGO, could do a better job of promoting a, a balanced distribution of power uh, as, they, as they try to do good in other ways. Do you know about that? <laughs> mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to... Want Anybody to want to comment? Yes, yeah. please well, do. You want to start with the... Uh, Corruption. corruption. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, the issue of corruption, um, and I think there is uh, a very important distinction that you made about corruption in general and the corruption of institutions, which I think is the fundamental, you know, crisis. Uh, the corruption, of course, financial corruption itself is a big problem in Africa. I mean, huge proportion of national resources are disappearing into private hands and worse still, moving to the West, uh, where... Um, as I joke with my students, you know, much of this stolen money are being used for, to back up the credit card system you know, in, in the West. Uh, a few African leaders, uh, particularly uh, Mobutu Seseko, at the time that he died, he had in foreign accounts as much money as the total national debt of DRC. Much of that money has disappeared into private accounts in, in Switzerland, which they will gladly use to support their credit system. But anyway, so you have a big problem of financial co corruption. But the issue that you raise about the corruption of the institutions themselves, which is a fundamental problem. In fact, it's a greater problem than financial institutions because it is a corruption of the institutions, of the processes, of the dip different processes, democratic processes included, that actually makes you know, financial corruption easier. And so you need uh, a process by which you have to reinvent those institutions. Those institutions cannot be reinvented, as I mentioned earlier, unless we rethink the African state. The ways that most of these states are constituted, and we've talked about differences, but the largest number of those states are constituted in ways in which the institutions that exist need to be corrupted so that those who hold power can continue to do so. So to be able to redress that challenge, you need a process of popular mobilization, at uh, this money we're talking about, perhaps we need a third you know, liberation in Africa. The first being the liberation that led to independence, the second being the, li the liberation that led to redemocratization in the 1990s. Perhaps we need a new kind of democrat I mean, liberation that would seize the existing democratic process and actually deepen democracy and expand the opportunities to be able to reconstitute the African state such, a, so, such that those institutions, when they are rebuilt, can actually be in the service of public good and the service of collective good. John, you can have the last word. A balance between foreign aid and the equilibrium between central governments and regional governments. Um, all U.S. assistance that I'm familiar with has always been through national governments. It's through national governments because they're very jealous. They won't let you work directly uh, with, uh, with local governments or local entities. But there's a huge amount of assistance that has gone from private entities all over the West into Africa, which can proceed without reference to the government. Governments don't like it, but they can't very well stop it. Okay, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So thank you very much. Please join me in thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.